Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of our God that we wish to contemplate for ourselves this morning is found recorded for us in Matthew, Matthew 22. We're really going to highlight verses 1 through 10. I'll mention verses uh, uh, 11 through 14, uh, and we'll highlight for ourselves just verse 5. Come to the wedding banquet. Thus far, God's word. Let's continue, of course, with prayer. Heavenly Father, what an awesome thing it is that we hear your invitation. We have received your notice that there is a banquet prepared, prepared for your son, Jesus Christ. May we, as your people, hear and come, come to the banquet and enjoy your fellowship and enjoy the marvel that you have prepared for us in eternal life and salvation. And all of this by grace. May we grasp this message in Jesus. Amen. So actually, we're, we're going to start uh, this particular sermon by, by talking about those last few verses, and that's 11 through 14, that, that's not going to make up the heart of, of my sermon this morning. And I, I'm going to speak about those verses because they do, they do address a situation uh, that I think is important for us to understand. It, it's that situation of the man at the wedding banquet who did not have on the wedding clothes. And I want to talk about that briefly because I, I do think that those words contain a very simple message that, that I, again, we, we need to, to contemplate, uh, even though we're going to contemplate it briefly. So the first thing to contemplate is, is just ask this question. How does this guy get in without wedding clothes? Now, we're not really told that in our text, we're, we're, but we're told clearly that this man's presence and his lack of wedding clothes was an offense to the couple and to the king. And here's a thought that I have. It, it's really, it's not a situation of this man sneaking in, and I don't think it's a situation of bribery uh, and that, because in actuality, it's not a case of sneaking in because, I mean, the king's servants went out and they brought everybody from the highways and the byways from off the street corners and that. They had come in, uh, so everybody was coming in, so it's not a matter really of sneaking. And, and I don't think it's a situation of bribery because that would be questioning the integrity of the servants of the king, and seriously, there's no call for that. So if you just eliminate those two things, you recognize a little, a little deeper thought needs to be had in, in this regard. Now, perhaps a little background. The custom of the time was that wedding clothes were provided for each guest that all the guests would look the same and no one in that wedding would stand out. In other words, it would be the bride and groom who would be standing out because of their special and their fancy wedding clothing. And so the wedding clothes of the guests were a type of an outer robe, maybe much like the robe I have on right now. It was an outer robe for the guests that that literally made all the guests blend in together so all the guests were the same. And, and again, the wedding couple would be the, the standout at the wedding. For, for a guest not to have a wedding garment on, I think means this. I think it, initially, that man took the garment. And then once he was inside, he disposed of that garment because he did not feel that that garment was good enough for himself. See, I don't think he refused the garment initially because doing so would have meant that the servants would not have allowed him in. So again, it's my opinion that he took the garment and then once at the wedding, in the wedding, he, he disposed of that garment. Now you have to ask, why, why do I think that's important? Well, I want you to consider that the wedding garment represents the robe of Christ's righteousness. In other words, you're at the wedding. You're in that crowd celebrating at this banquet because of the king's favor and goodness. Yet, yet somewhere along the line, this man decided that what the king was about, what the king had provided, was not good enough for him. And so he cast off the wedding garment. And by the way, I think that explains why you can't give the king an answer. When the king confronts him, I mean, how do you say, when you're confronted by the king, how do you say to the king, well, you know, well, your majesty, I just thought your clothes were garbage and that what I had on was better. When, when confronted by the king, I think this man realized 
just how foolish his thinking had been and how bad his attitude was. And I think at least, at least at this point he grasped, it's just better to keep your mouth shut at this point. Now, my dear people, I, I think this, this man represents the person who has decided that they don't need Jesus Christ in his garment of righteousness. This is for the person who has decided that they, they think they are worthy. They think that what the king offers is not good enough, not sufficient enough, not, not worthy enough of their high and self-exalted status. And I think this is just a great reminder to any human, to any human, to never determine that you are greater or smarter or wiser or better than the king and what he has provided. In truth, when you look at this, you realize that this man is really no better off than the others that the king is going to deal with. And now you and I can jump in. We, consider, we can consider the rest of this parable. Uh, and we're going to do so under this theme. Come to the wedding banquet. Now again, I don't, I don't think there's anybody who's sitting here who does not grasp the very pointed message that this parable is pointing to. Re remember, parables are earthly stories with spiritual meanings. In this case, is there anyone here who, who doesn't grasp that the king is the almighty father of heaven and earth, that the son the wedding banquet is held for is none other than Jesus Christ, the son of God. And thus, you grasp that this is the very picture of eternal life and salvation that God has prepared for his guests. In other words, this parable is about eternal life and salvation. Eternal life and salvation provided by the Father, fulfilled in the Son, and granted to us by the very grace and compassion of a merciful and loving God. There, there's really no other way to grasp this. And, and it's in grasping this base fact of this parable that the true nature and the horror of what the invited guest did comes out. Now, here's a little bit more context for this particular parable. I want you to understand that Jesus speaks these words to the people and to the Jewish religious leadership that are gathered around him on Tuesday of Holy Week. In other words, Good Friday is coming. Jesus is going to die that day. Now, this whole discourse really starts for us at the beginning of chapter 21. And chapter 21 is the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And then comes what the events of Monday. Monday, where Jesus cleansed the temple once again of all the money changers and those who were doing business in the temple courtyards. And don't forget that later on on Monday, Jesus causes a fig tree to wither and die because it had no fruit on it. Now it's Tuesday morning. And now the opportunity arises for these Jewish religious leaders leaders to confront Jesus. And what do they say? By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? I don't know. You caused a tree to die overnight. Pay attention to this guy. But that's not the way they think. Now, honestly, these are kind of wide-reaching questions, aren't they? By the way, I think if Jesus had done nothing more in the past three years but do some teaching and gather some disciples, I don't think these questions would have been asked. But for the past three years, the fact of the matter is that Jesus has performed a multitude of miracles. Seriously, Jesus has, to my best guess, done miracles that, have, that can be counted in the hundreds of thousands. And I can also tell you that these men knew they're the religious leadership, and they would have thoroughly investigated everything about Jesus. They knew every aspect and fact about the life of Jesus. Yep. Yeah. They knew about the virgin birth. They knew about him being born of the house of David. They knew that he was born in Bethlehem. They knew about the singing angels and the joyful shepherds. They knew about the magi who showed up. They knew about the flight into Egypt. They knew about the return to Nazareth. And they knew about the visit of the 12-year-old Jesus to the temple. In other words, they know who Jesus is. They suspect who Jesus is. But you see, they don't want to acknowledge that. They don't want people to believe that because they grasp that to allow such a thing means the end of your way of life. The end of your self-exalted religious importance, not to mention probably the end of your wealth and your status as religious leaders 
of God's people. And so on Tuesday morning, it is to these people that Jesus speaks these words of this parable to try and wake them up from the spiritual death their souls have undergone. And you, you are the invited guest of the king. Now let that sink in. The king has a son, and the king has prepared a wedding banquet. And if you paid attention to the text, you recognize that properly the king has extended invitation. The king has sent out invitations way early so that you could get ready and so that you could be a part of that celebration. The royal wedding. What an honor. You have been invited to the royal wedding. You have been considered by the king to, to be worthy of being a part of his joy and his celebration of family and love. The invitation are set. You've been told, set that date, mark that date on your calendar, it's going to be the party of the year, and everyone who is anyone is going to be there. King has invited you. And then the day of the wedding arrives. The hour comes when wedding guests should be arriving and all that stuff. They should begin arriving and what do they find? No one is there. But I want you to recognize that the king, the king in total graciousness, Willing to overlook this act of disregard, the king sends out his servants to remind those who have been invited and to get them moving that they might come and be a part. Oh, but one, just one, one little sentence kind of sums up the problem, doesn't it? But they did not want to come. And you go, what? This is the king. This is the king's party. This is his family and his son and, and his willingness to share his life and his bounty with you. And you don't want to come? Have you no regard for your king? And by the way, are you passing judgment on the king? Are you sending him the message that you don't care for him or you don't like him or you don't like what he's all about? And why? Why wouldn't you want to come? Except for your own foolishness and your own heart of evil. But again, I want you to notice that the king is still gracious. He must have suspected all of this. He must have felt all of this horrid attitude of his invited guest. He must have. But, but he doesn't give up. What we're told is he sends more servants. And I want you to note that the invitation is upbeat and the invitation suggests it's going to be an awesome event. Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. You know, the finest of wines and the best of meat like you heard in the Old Testament reading, right? Please note, there's no threats there. There's excitement. There's allure. There's excitement for good and wonderful things, the best of the best. Clearly, the king has gone all out. Clearly, the king is telling you there will be no lack of anything for anyone at that feast. Come, 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 and be with the king. <coughs> but again, the stark words of what happens sound horrible. But those who were invited paid no attention and went off, one to his own farm, another to his business. The rest seized the king's servants, mistreated them, and killed them. Dear guests, your life, your wealth, your farm, your business, yeah, 
everything about your life is because of the king and his governance, or if you would, and his kingdom. He rules for you and your betterment. He has done everything to make your life the best and absolutely blessed. And this is how you act? You show contempt for the king? You show your lack of honor and respect as you beat and kill his servants? Have you no grasp for the foolishness of what you have done? I take it then, by your actions, that you don't think that the king is capable of rule or justice. You don't even think the king is really capable of truly being the king, do you? You will be wrong. Now who, who blames the king for his anger and his actions? He has been despised and maligned, dis dishonored and disrespected in every way imaginable by these invited guests. The king is right in his actions. And I think these words today serve for all the world who has decided that the Lord God is not worthy. That the Lord God is not worthy of being paid attention to or the Lord God is not worthy in any way for them. And it doesn't matter what your excuse is. Only that you have dishonored and you have despised the true and only God. This God who so loved you that he sent his son to die for your sins and to grant you the status of being an invited guest. I simply plead with you, I plead with all, please, please, do not treat the wonder of God and Jesus in this way. Now, the wonder of this parable is what follows. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. So go to the main crossroads and invite as many as you find to the wedding banquet. Those servants went out to the roads, and gathered together everyone they found, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. And I want to tell you, dear people, it's those words, those words that lift up my spirit, those words that cause me to be filled with, with joy and thanks to God. Because I readily recognize that I am one of those who has come from the highways and the byways of the world. And I might have been a well-dressed traveler on the road, or, more likely, I was perhaps a scheming thief along that road, ready to rob you. For you see, you have to understand that the good and the bad are brought in. But the king has extended his invitation to all. The king wants to share his banquet and the joy of family with any and with all who will come and who will be a part. It does not matter what you were as you were on the road. What matters is that you heard the invitation, you heard the call to come and be a part of the king's life and banquet. You did not give an excuse. You did not go about your business. You did not abuse and misuse the messengers of the king. In fact, you, probably just in shock, with awe and wonder, you simply believed the message. You heard that the king wanted you to come and to be a part of his banquet. And then you found out that that king had a garment, a wedding garment, just just for you. And you are at that wedding. You are on the same and equal footing with all, all who are gathered there. You are a guest. You are a valued participant. You are a grateful soul who knows the love of the king on this day. The love of the king on this day is yours. 
Now, dear people, I'm guessing that you grasp that the total, the total wonder and awe of what is being taught here. God in his grace and love wants all to come. God in his grace wants all to come and be a part of his banquet of his gift, of his gift, his gift of eternal life and salvation with his son. It is not God's desire to hurt and harm. It's not God's desire to suppress or browbeat. But it is his desire to share his goodness and his love with those who would come. Yes, this parable is one that highlights and focuses in on the goodness and the love and the compassion and the grace of God for the souls of the world. Now, if you want, you can do what the world does. Let's pay attention to the world. You recognize these words are true. You, you can focus in on those who did not come, and you can focus in on what happened to them. That's what the world does with the Lord our God. They see or they hear about the righteous and the just actions of the Lord, and they condemn that as horrid and totally unloving, and they never once, they never once give any thought to the wrong and evil actions of the invited who despised and hated the Lord. Oh, oh you could do that. But again, I'm going to simply tell you that what you will have done is you'll have just made yourself one of them, one of those invited guests to refuse to come. And you will be filled with contempt and hatred for God and his graciousness and his goodness. And sadly, but truthfully, I will have to tell you that you can expect from the Lord God what they got. And it won't be good. But me, I marvel. I marvel at the goodness and the grace of this king that I will be filled with awe and wonder that he has invited me to be a part of his banquet. It's clear that the king has provided and has given all out of the goodness and love of his heart that he has invited, invited unworthy me. And my heart is filled with joy and gladness because in truth the actions of this king, his grace and his love has forever changed my life. And I am grateful. And I am humbled. And I simply pray not only for myself, but for all of us. Dear King, let us be your guests. And let us be your servants now and forever. Amen.